Thank you very much, and thank you, Kerry, and thank Kerry for thank you for your service uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here in Little Rock for the first time. I, I've heard a lot about it, uh, what with having served in the Clinton administration, and it just seemed uh, they should have moved the capital from Washington to Little Rock. I think, uh, uh, so it's it's a pleasure to to finally get here. Pleasure to uh, have this wonderful tour of the uh, of the Clinton Library. Um, I found my name in a couple of spots there. Uh, under um, if you you can find his daily schedule for every day he was president, and if you remember what day you were over at the White House, you can find your name li listed as a note taker. So there I was. And and um, but maybe more poignantly, there's a picture there of. Um, the Bosnian uh, team, and we're going out to um, sort of engage with the uh, Bosnians, the Serbs, the Croats, and we had just lost uh, several members of our team in a kind of nasty uh, uh, accident that took place high above uh, Sarajevo, a place called Mount, Mount Igman. And so we brought the bodies back, uh, buried them, and this picture is in um, is in the chapel at Fort Myers, just outside Washington. It's of President Clinton giving us our instructions as we're standing there listening to, you know, his view of what we need to do now that we've uh, uh, reconstituted the team and we're pre prepared to go out. And uh, I describe a lot of this in my book because I think it's important to, for people to understand that this uh, uh, diplomacy, foreign policy, is very much of a human game. I mean, you're really working with other people. You're, uh, it's, it's all about teamwork. It's all about working with others. So it's a, um, uh, so to see some of these uh, scenes in this uh, museum really brought back, uh, brought back memories. Um, what I thought I would do uh, during the half hour I have is maybe talk a little about uh, uh, some of the foreign policy of cha challenges and then engage in the uh, very crass business I've learned to accept that this is what I got to do of selling my book, uh, which I think is uh, on sale. There it is, right over there, on sale for very good price, right? I mean, I mean on a per page basis, it's an incredible price. Uh, uh, you know, I should say in uh, government, you never uh, write, or I never wrote anything more than a two-page memo, and uh, you know, in government, no one even reads page two, and so. Uh, I remember getting on to page three and telling my wife, Julie, Julie, I'm on page three now. Never been here before. <laughs> and then sort of like that scene in Forrest Gump, I just kept going and going. And finally, on page 403, I stopped. So, uh, uh, but it was uh, quite an adventure to, uh, to recreate, in my mind, uh, these, these events. And then really to see that even today, you know, we're on the, this is, this year is the 20th anniversary of the Dayton uh, Peace Accords, uh, where, you know, a lot of these issues are still out there. Some are better than they were. Some are, uh, frankly, worse than they were. I would put uh, Iraq in that category. But I think all need to be, uh, continue to be uh, worked on by our, um, uh, by this president and by the next president as well. Um, a few years ago, or actually in the 1950s, there was a uh, Polish uh, party first secretary uh, named Władysław Gomułka. Władysław Gomułka is a name probably lost to history. And uh, Władysław Gomułka, the leader of Poland at the time, was uh, known for very long speeches and not particularly successful metaphors. And one day he stood in front of a large crowd in the southern Polish city of Kraków and said, comrades, just a few years ago, our nation stood on the very edge of a deep abyss. And I'm here to tell you today, comrades, we've taken an important step forward. <laughs> and so I, I think it's, it's uh, really important that as you look at some of these problems, <laughs> problems that really took you to the edge uh, a few years ago, don't take that important step forward. Take a step back and kind of figure out uh, what we need to do and what our uh, what uh, the challenges are. Certainly, um, I think the Obama administration has its hands full uh, today. Uh, there is the challenge of 
dealing with the fact that Iraq, I mean, if you spend five minutes in Iraq, you will be convinced that taking Saddam Hussein off the board was a very good day. I mean, uh, to see what he did to that country, to see what he did to those people, uh, you will think, glad we did that. But at the same time, you'll see the complexity of that country and the fact that we went into it really not understanding it. Uh, we did not, for example, understand the centrality of the um, fault line, if you will, uh, between the Shia world and the Sunni world. We saw the fault line of dictatorship and democracy, but we didn't see the real fault line that, would, that we were going to then excite and create uh, or, uh, these, these great difficulties that, that country is having. We brought um, democracy, more or less, and democracy is always has to be looked at as a, not of a state of being, but a, more of a direction. Are you getting more democratic? Are you getting less democratic? So we kind of pointed the country in a more democratic uh, uh, direction. And yet, when you look at how, um, when you look at how uh, uh, elections have gone in Iraq, you can see that uh, the, op the organizing political identity in that country is not whether you believe in freedom or whether you believe in dictatorship. The organizing political identity in that country is whether you're a Shia or a Sunni. I mean, I wish it were things like whether you believe in uh, big government or small government or you know more social programs or less social programs. I wish it were that kind of thing where people have some opportunity to kind of shift between them and change their minds after a few years. But in fact, it's between these two uh, sects, if you will, of the uh, Islamic uh, of the uh, of Islam, Shia and Sunni. And so, for the first time in many centuries, the U.S. in, in effect installed a Shia government in, in Iraq. Uh, Iraq had been uh, ruled by various forms of Sunnis for centuries. And the Sunnis are the majority, by far the majority in the Arab world. I mean, it goes all the way to, uh, you know, all the way through North Africa. Most, every single Arab country, let's put aside Syria for a second, is, is Sunni-led. And, um, and so we, in, in effect, created the only Shia-led Arab country. Well, lo and behold, not every other Sunni country was enthused about this. I would say no Sunni country was enthused about this. And that is the problem with trying to uh, manage Iraq as a democracy, because it's going to be Shia-led as long as the, as the Sunnis are only some 20% of the population there. Uh, the Sunnis are not going to rule a, a democratic uh, uh, Iraq. Now, what we, of course, hoped for was that the Shia in, um, in Iraq would rule the way the uh, uh, Nelson Mandela uh, ruled in, in South Africa. Nelson Mandela understood that the white South Africans had ruled South Africa for decades, if not centuries, and so Nelson Mandela understood the need to reach out to the uh, white South African population and make sure they felt a part of the new system. Well, um, instead, we got a, a prime minister named Nouri al-Maliki, and uh, Nouri al-Maliki, uh, as I like to say, if he ever had charisma, it cleared up a long time ago because uh, <laughs> he um, was not a fun guy to, uh, to deal with and was not a person who really necessarily attracted, uh, was attractive to people to say, you know, I'm going to follow him even though I'm a Sunni and he's a Shia. So Maliki was a very, very tough customer. Uh, he um, did not understand this outreach issue. He, I think, alienated even more Sunnis uh, than, um, than were already alienated from, by the entire process. And so as uh, Syria blew up, and as we saw many of these Sunni groups that had become, that had become insurgencies in Iraq, who essentially had to flee Iraq when the United States and, uh, and frankly, the government in Baghdad were successful in, tu in turning a lot of these uh, Sunni-led tribal leaders, Sunni tribal leaders in Western Iraq against some of these Al-Qaeda types in, um, in uh, uh, Anbar and other places in Western, Western Iraq. Now they are back. The Sunni tribal leaders have kind of had it with Maliki. I don't think Hadi, uh, Haidar al-Abadi's uh, 
uh, ascendancy is really going to change much uh, for them. And so I think we have a real problem in, our, in Iraq, and it's not going to be a problem that's easy to solve. I think the, um, the effort to try to allow the Iraqis to create a so strong central government, uh, as, we, as we encourage them to, uh, to do, uh, was wrong-headed. I think there should have been much more effort at local autonomy, a kind of different constitution that really understood the heterogeneity of this, uh, of this country. And so I think they have to get there, but how they get there and whether they can get there still all living in one country, the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shia, I think is going to be a real challenge for Iraq. Uh, certainly ISIS is a... Uh, is a group that there is, frankly, in my view, no room for diplomacy with. I don't think these are people that we can reason with. I don't think these are people that we can somehow turn. Uh, you know, what we did in, in, in Iraq, in Western Iraq, was we'd show people money. You know, I know it's a shocking thing to know that money plays in diplomacy. And so we would uh, say, okay, Sheikh, here's some money, but no more shooting at our troops. Um, I don't think that kind of process is sort of available to us with ISIS. I think there's a huge scope for diplomacy uh, in the ISIS crisis, but not so much with ISIS as it is as the diplomacy needs to be applied to countries that, uh, from where there has been a lot of support for ISIS. Countries in the Gulf states, uh, countries in the Arab Peninsula, where a lot of the support, the um, Financial support for ISIS has uh, has come, so I think we need to be very active with these countries and do our best to try to uh, try to cut off supplies for for ISIS. I think eventually, you know, there's some I think room for optimism that uh, ISIS has the momentum of ISIS in Western Iraq has been very much uh, uh, blunted. I think the um, ISIS is in some, and there's some evidence to suggest that they're retreating back to Syria and that they probably won't be able to be successful in, in Iraq. But if our project in Iraq is to be successful, it's not just eliminating or driving out this uh, uh, virulently uh, 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 bloodthirsty, really, uh, uh, groups uh, as ISIS. It's in helping the Iraqis, or at least being giving a helping hand when they ask for it, for the Iraqis to form uh, a system of governance that makes Kurds, Sunnis, and Shia all feel they can live together. And that is uh, still, I think, a very difficult proposition. I think, though, turning to Syria, you know, for many Americans, they looked at the Arab Spring, or whatever we want to call it today. We'll call it the Arab thing at this point. Uh, but uh, they looked to that process some years ago, and they thought, oh, finally, Arabs, this is awakening. People are saying, enough of these corrupt governments. We're going to sweep them away, introduce uh, more transparent democratic systems. Again, I submit to you this was a kind of mirror imaging of the problems in that part of the world, as if they are motivated by the same things that would motivate us were we in such circumstances. Yes, we want more transparency. Yes, we'd want more uh, freedoms. I submit to you, though, there are other things going on, and I submit to you that it was very sort of heterogeneous there. You had different situations in different countries. I think within Syria, you have a situation that is curiously uh, similar to Iraq, except that whereas in Iraq, the Sunnis are a 20 percent, the Sunni Arabs are a 20 percent minority, in Syria, the Sunni Arabs are a 60 percent majority. And so um, you can see that the lines that were drawn between Iraq and, uh, and um, uh, Syria were probably uh, not drawn on, on uh, sectarian or ethnographic basis. Uh, if Sykes-Picot, if those two uh, British and French uh, diplomats were alive today, I think they'd have some splaining to do on this because uh, I don't think they had a clue what they were uh, essentially uh, dividing up. And so Syria, I think it's fair to say, and I think the history books will be very clear, as soon as the Arab Spring broke out, uh, in Syria, you had uh, the people brought out or began a sectarian knife fight that has not, uh, that has simply shown no signs of abetting. I think the United States made a mistake in Syria. Uh, 
And the mistake is not that we somehow didn't jump into it or you know, take that step into the abyss. The mistake is that we immediately assumed it was somehow akin to the issues that were already going on in the Maghreb, in northern uh, North Africa, or in uh, Egypt. So whereas the Obama administration was accused of being too slow in getting rid of Mubarak, um, and by the way, when someone has kind of helped you out for 30 years, I don't think one should be the first to push them under the, bu under the bus. That's a personal opinion. Uh, it was quite clear that Mubarak had outlived lived his shelf life with the Egyptian people. It was pretty clear that uh, his government was on those indexes of corruption and things like that was going, were going in the wrong direction. Nonetheless, I think it was appropriate for us not to be the first to push him under the bus. So as if to compensate for our slowness in reacting to uh, Mubarak, remember we were trying to argue that Mubarak should stay and be there when they conducted a new election, whereas the Egyptian people were saying, uh-uh, we want him out today. Uh, so I think there was a feeling we could compensate by being a little too quick to tell, um, tell Bashir al-Assad that it's time to go. And so very early on, uh, in the uh, Syrian uprising, the U.S. took the position that uh, Assad should leave. Well, um, Assad is certainly not on my Christmas list and uh, probably wouldn't have been on yours either. Uh, he's uh, very, uh, you know, he comes from a family that has uh, killed a person or two. Uh, it is a, not a very nice regime in the least. But um, when you're calling for someone to leave, there has to be some concept of who it is you think ought to come in after that person, unless you're quite willing to accept chaos. And I submit to you that there are very few circumstances, there are circumstances, but few circumstances in which chaos is preferable to someone, uh, to an identifiable leader. So in saying that Assad had to go, we thought maybe we could further isolate him, uh, push him into the corner, embolden the opposition, and before you know it, uh, he'd be gone, and we'd look very prescient in saying he's got to go, and lo and behold, he's gone. Uh, the trouble was, I think it did more to isolate us than it did to isolate Assad, and I think we have uh, paid for that ever since. First of all, uh, by isolating him and saying we're not going to deal with the, his, his uh, regime, otherwise known as the Alawite regime, which is a sort of tribal identification uh, less than 20% of Syrians, maybe even only 15% of Syrians, that we, we um, by isolating him, we then basically threw our lot with the uh, opposition. And um, too often, many of our uh, journalists and others thought that the opposition would be, you know, these people who wanted democracy. And I think it has now been pretty clear that much of the opposition, at least the military opposition in the field, as, uh, as opposed to the cafes in, uh, in London, but the, field, the uh, battlefields in Syria, that military opposition to Assad was in the form of uh, groups like al-Nusra, and now uh, the Islamic State forces. In short, these are not people that we should necessarily be supporting, and yet they comprise the main body of this uh, opposition. There are those, of course, who say that, uh, well, we should help uh, uh, support a moderate opposition. I love moderates. I wish we had more of them in our country. But uh, just as we sometimes have trouble finding moderates in our country, believe me, it's even more difficult finding them in Syria. And so I'm, frankly speaking, a little skeptical that training 5,000 moderates is going, that they are going to first defeat al-Nusra second defeat al-Nusra, which is the al-Qaeda affiliate in this uh, war, secondly defeat uh, ISIS, thirdly go on to defeat the, uh, the um, uh, Bashir al-Assad's forces, who by the way were reinforced by some Iranian help as well as Hezbollah help, and then what? I guess they're going to figure out how to have a victory parade into uh, Damascus. In short, I think it's kind of a, a long shot. And uh, I would like to see the U.S. spend a little more time, uh, not so much on talking about what, you know, what weapons we can bring to the battlefield, but rather talking about what we would like to see Syria uh, become in the future. Because wars, wars do end. Wars do end. And um, 
at the end of a war, you have to have some system of governance. And I don't think the United States has kind of stepped up and said what it is we even want to see in Syria. We talk about provisional elections for provisional government that will draw up a provisional constitution that will be some sort of provisional interim authority in Syria. Well, I, I submit to you that most people will not climb out of their foxholes and end the war on the basis of creating such provisional structures. I don't think it's really going to work. And so what I would like us to do is maybe reach back 20 years and remember what happened in, in, uh, in uh, Bosnia. You know, people often say that what happened in Bosnia was a courageous uh, effort to create a peace process in a, a U.S. Uh, air base in Dayton, Ohio, known as Wright-Patterson Air Base. And uh, no question that was important. But what was much more important than all that work in, in Dayton was what went on a year and a half before. And what went on a year and a half before was something called the contact group uh, consisting of Russia, and I always think it's nice when you can figure out a way to bring Russia into some of these things. Russia, France, Germany, the UN, Italy got involved, uh, uh, the US, of course, and we, uh, and Germany, and we managed to create on two pages what Bosnia should look like in the future when the war ends. Bosnia shall consist of two entities. The uh, one entity shall be 51% of the territory, that is the Bosnian-Croat uh, Federation. The other entity, the Serb entity, would be 49%. There should be a collective presidency that has a uh, rotating representation of, of Serbs, Croats, and, um, and Bosnian Muslims at the time, now called Bosniaks. There should be a parliament that also unites Bosnia together. There should have uh, um, regional parliaments in the Federation area and the Bosnian Serb area. So when this stuff came out in the, in the um, late spring of 1994, people kind of laughed at it. I mean, if you looked at a map of, uh, of Bosnia, you could see uh, the, uh, in, the, in the maps we had in the State Department, the, it was a sort of uh, pinkish color, and that was where the Serbs were in a yellow color, and that's where the Bosnian uh, uh, Croat Federation was, and there was a lot of pink in that map. It was something like 80% uh, uh, Serb. So everyone laughed at this, uh, at this uh, contact group plan. But eventually, as people kind of, as, as the war stalemated and people really didn't know what to do, suddenly people got behind this plan. So I support the, I support the contact group plan. And so eventually, as uh, we gave some weapons to some people, and by the way, the Bosnians got weapons from Iran. This is not always a pretty picture, I might add. But eventually, um, they had a territorial division that was much closer to the contact group plan, and that's when the Dayton Peace Accords began, and we essentially implemented the contact group plan. A uh, two pages of sort of general principles is not an implementation plan. Implementation is where it really, that's where you get to your one to 15,000 um, uh, maps where you have to kind of figure out zones of separation, a lot of things like that. That's how you figure out how the, you know, you needed to build some kind of constitutional structure. But we had a basic plan. And I think this is what, what is sadly lacking in the entire uh, uh, Syria uh, issue. I mention all this because um, it's not that Syria is the most important place in the world. I don't know what is, but it's probably not Syria. But I think it should trouble our consciences, all of us, that as we sit here in this peaceful confines of this presidential library, some 200 and counting, 200,000 people have been killed in, in Syria, and there's no end in sight. And I think the only way to end this is to have a plan going forward. If you have rejectionists who absolutely refuse the plan, that's when military force can be applied. That is to people who reject a political deal. But when there's no political deal, how can you blame anybody for rejecting what? What are they rejecting? There's no deal out on the table. So I think we need uh, more of this kind of uh, uh, American leadership in, in diplomacy. I mean, to be sure, um, what our troops did in Bosnia, when they went in, they implemented a political arrangement. There's a reason why we never had a single casualty among our U.S. troops, our hostile casualty uh, in, um, 
in Bosnia. It's because everyone accepted the plan, and so we went in to enforce the plan, and it went very well. I think uh, we eventually, we need that in Syria, and we need it, uh, we need it soon. Um, I think part of what happened here was the, our president uh, announced something called the pivot. I think it's very important to spend more time on East Asia. I was the assistant secretary for East Asia. You did have the sense that, you know, why are we so uh, wrapped up in places in the Middle East and not doing enough about, you know, relationships in places like Indonesia. Indonesia has some 240 million people. Why aren't we more engaged in a place like that? China has 1.4 billion people. Some of these Balkan countries uh, that I dealt with, you know, they could fit in a, in a Beijing city bus. I mean, this was uh, quite a, uh, you know, we, needed to, we need to be more involved with, this, with this, the East Asia. But I think as with any sort of major muscle move in diplomacy, uh, there were, it is kind of fraught with unintended consequences. I mean, even minor muscle moves in diplomacy are fraught with unintended consequence. Remember the story in 1815 at the Congress of Vienna where the Russian ambassador slumped over and died of a heart attack and the French ambassador said, why did he do that? Uh, so people always will question your motivations. And so uh, when you uh, consider uh, you know, this motivation of moving from uh, to the Pacific as the pivot envisioned, it was fraught with unintended consequences. The first being that we didn't care anymore about the Middle East, and I think we're paying that price. The second being that we didn't really care that much about the Atlantic relationship. And you know, with due respect to Europeans in the room, they're upset when we care, but they're really upset when they think we don't care. And so, uh, so I think that created a lot of uh, misconception. And finally, as we go to Asia, it became a kind of exercise, not so much in engaging ourselves in this fascinating and uh, positive part in the world, but it became an exercise in, in appearing that we uh, want to somehow uh, constrain China. And I submit to you that uh, China is about as big and complex place as you'll ever see in the world. And it behooves us to figure out a way to deal with China and not just to look at uh, China from the point of view of the confrontation uh, that uh, many people believe surely will come. There's a lot of talk about uh, how China, this is a case of the rising power, China, the established power of the United States, and the inevitability of conflict between a rising power and established power. And people who could not spell Thucydides have brought out Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian Wars as proof that uh, somehow this is some uh, kind of inevitability. I submit to you there are a few differences between contemporary China and ancient Athens or contemporary United States and ancient Sparta that you, you might want to uh, consider before assuming that this is a, uh, a grim replay of the 30 years uh, Peloponnesian Wars. In short, we need to develop uh, patterns of cooperation with China. We need to find ways to work with China. I, I think uh, I would suggest that the first place we ought to work with China is, first of all, we need to establish priorities, what's important to us. I think priorities, whenever someone can explain priorities, it's something you can work, work with. And when, people, when someone says everything is a priority, you can assume that nothing's a priority. So I would start with a priority of doing something about North Korea's nuclear aspirations. Um, certainly, to some extent, this is a triumph of uh, hope over experience because so far the Chinese have not done a lot. But I would suggest to you that China is changing in its views toward uh, North Korea. There is an understanding in China that the relationship with North Korea is from its past and the relationship with the U.S. and the rest of the world is, is in its future. And while China has a lot of uh, nasty uh, maritime disputes with its uh, neighbors, by the way, maritime disputes, the blame for which I think one can uh, uh, rest, rest with the Chinese. I think the Chinese have been very clumsy in how they've handled some of these relationships. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, that is not what makes China, China's relations with the rest of us so problematic. After all, everybody, you know, except for, um, you know, um, uh, uh, the Czech Republic or someone has uh, has uh, maritime problems. Um, I think what is uh, what makes China's uh, 
foreign policy so difficult for so many people is the implicit support for North Korea, which uh, has uh, certainly uh, has one of the worst, if not the worst, human rights records in the world. Um, now we know they also seem to launch cyber attacks. By the way, I saw the movie. It wasn't my favorite movie in the world, but uh, uh, not so much as a as a solidarity with Sony Corporation, as a uh, solidarity in my view that the North Koreans could do no right. I watched it anyway, and uh, it was not bad. Uh, so, um, so North Korea is engaged in all kinds of things, and I think it's time to really work with the Chinese because this accident of the uh, 20th century, which is just a scar on the Korean Peninsula, and frankly, uh, a division of, of people who had no, um, uh, the Koreans were not responsible for their division. This is not Germany. People always say, well, this is just like Germany. No, it isn't. Korea did not start World War II. And so uh, I think uh, it behooves us to work with China and to set the priority of finding patterns of cooperation such that uh, the Chinese can understand that they should be very happy if there's a united Korean Peninsula with the Republic of Korea as its neighbor. So I think um, there are a lot of uh, uh, issues like that that will keep diplomats uh, very busy for, uh, for years to come. What I wanted to do in my book, though, was to um, kind of show how, uh, from the point of view of a foreign service officer, sort of out there in the um, in these embassies and, and how you really have to kind of uh, uh, do things and at times do things without guidance. One of my mentors, actually one of my mentors and my tormentors, uh, uh, Richard Holbrook, would say, say to me, the only thing worse than, uh, than uh, uh, not having guidance is to have guidance. And uh, he was quite right because sometimes you get this stuff from Washington, you go, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, I can crumple it up and throw it at them, but uh, that's about it. Uh, so I think it's, uh, I, I wanted people to see what it's sort of like out there uh, working in the, uh, the U.S., uh, working for the U.S., trying to get some stuff done, trying to do things in a, uh, where things, you know, you can't wait for, wait for help. I have one section called Calling an Audible where you had to, I had to decide whether or not to meet the North Koreans and not wait for, uh, for any guidance from anyone. I, I tried to, I feel there are too many of these sort of Washington books where there's this kind of score settling going on. And so I really said, I'm not going to do that. I did make an exception for our former vice president because uh, uh, in his book, which you can check out of your local library, but please don't buy it, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he uh, has a chapter devoted to what, a, what terrible people uh, Condoleezza Rice and I are. I mean, and he um, sort of goes on and on. And I'm thinking when I read it, uh, and then I reshelved it on the bottom shelf with the uh, spine in. Uh, I, uh, when you're an author, you learn tricks like that. You know. My wife actually took my book and put it on the bestseller uh, uh, thing at the airport in Denver, and it sold within 30 minutes. So <laughs> we monitored it from the McDonald's across the way there. And I said, God, someone's buying it, Julie. Do it again. Uh, so. Uh, where was I? Anyway, uh, I think, so I, I, my feeling is if, you know, if, Ch if Cheney had such a problem with us negotiating with the North Koreans, he could have, you know, walked a few feet and uh, gone into the president's uh, office and said, Mr. President, I got a real problem with what Secretary Rice and, uh, you know, what's his name are doing on, on North Korea. And, you know, it would have been the end of it. But to wait four years to do a memoir, I thought it was in rather bad taste, so I just thought I'd follow suit. So that's the only, uh, that's the only kind of uh, nasty stuff there. I, uh, I wanted it to be, I want people to understand the, the, nat the nature of sort of the team sport of diplomacy. So there'll be a lot of names that uh, you don't necessarily have to remember. They're colleagues of mine, but I want you to see how, you know, some people who are, very junior foreign service officers can make some real, uh, real contributions.
I, um, I think it's important, too, for people to understand that uh, the Foreign Service, you know, becoming an ambassador is not the entry-level position. I mean, uh, becoming an ambassador is what you do after many years of uh, schlepping people's luggage in from the airport and doing other things. And so I, I want people to understand that even in those junior positions, you can be called upon to do important things. And, uh, and to um, uh, really think of your think on your feet and make a contribution, and so um, I pick up the story very early on. Actually, when uh, my dad was in the foreign service, and I pick up the story when I was uh, some seven years old, and finding our ha house had been trashed in uh, Belgrade, uh, Yugoslavia. I came back from school, and all the windows were broken, and I didn't know what had happened. There were all this nasty uh, uh, graffiti all over the road, and I came up. To the house and my mother simply uh, opened the door and said Chris you won't be playing outdoors today and then uh, explained to me that it was when a um, Congolese leader named Lumumba was killed and these leftist students in Yugoslavia went and trashed the first Americans house that they knew and so ours was that house and you know we weren't evacuated there was nothing in the news about it I went off to school the next day and sort of life went on in the hill family but uh, i want people to see that you know this stuff has been going on for a lot longer than we know collectively um, i do uh, i spent a lot of time in the balkans not that uh, everyone really needs to remember you know names like srebrenica and things like that but uh, i think people do need to understand that uh, Wars don't always start in the center. They don't always start in important places. They often start in the scruffy edges. And if they're not taken care of in those scruffy edges, they can cause sort of deep problems in the center. Uh, for example, um, it is no, there's no question that uh, the human rights violations going on in the Balkans were a major reason why our country got involved with the Balkans. But at the same time, I think it's important for people to understand that another reason we got involved is our relationships with those European countries were really going very badly as we uh, uh, sat in Washington accusing the British and French of giving in to, uh, to uh, genocidal policies on the part of uh, Milosevic. And the British and the French would say, well, that's easy for you to say, Americans. You don't have any troops here. We have troops here, so we don't need your advice as long as we have troops here and you don't. And so this was very corrosive. And uh, so the idea that you can criticize others for the job they're doing, but then not do, not do any of the job yourself is kind of hard to take. And uh, I think uh, we were really in a very bad way with the Europeans. And I think we ended up in a better place thanks to working together uh, with them in the Balkans. Um, I spent a lot of time explaining this, uh, these North Korea talks. Again, not that North Korea is necessarily the most important country in the world, whatever they think, uh, but um, I, to understand how to try to get other countries to work together on things, and also the fact that a lot of diplomacy, you know, it's not always what the press thinks it's about. Of course it was about trying to disarm the North Koreans, but as I said earlier, it's also about trying to get uh, get uh, the U.S. and South Koreans uh, uh, back into formation and you know, working together on things and showing the mutual respect that has been such a hallmark of our 50 years. So a lot of things uh, had, to be, um, had to be fixed in that. And then finally, um, I wanted to write a book that is accessible to anyone with a sense of humor. Uh, I, I just think it's important to understand that uh, you can't go grim-faced uh, through everything. You can't be Bill Belichick on all of these things. You have to kind of uh, lighten up at times. And uh, I'm from New England, so we're having a little problem today, but we'll get through it. Uh, so uh, you have to kind of lighten up, and I think uh, uh, we managed to do that throughout the book. And so I'm, um, I uh, have often told people that uh, sense of humor is, uh, you know, it can be a really constant companion and it uh, needs to come out in, those, in the toughest of times. So with those um, comments, maybe we can open up to a more interactive portion and then um, sign some books. So, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, let's okay. Wait. Yeah, let's wait for the mic. To, we, oh, okay. That's good. We'll, we'll get there. Skip, should I did you, did call you, on? I'll call him. Who, did someone raise your hand over here? Yes, sir. Let's go right here okay. first. 
You can call them. I just got to make sure they got a mic. Okay. <laughs> I was just hoping you'd give us your thoughts on Yemen. It's been central to the administration's strategy to combat Islamic terrorism, and then there were some uh, big events that happened there yesterday. And yep. hoping, and I think it furthers the divide between Sunnis and Shia. Yeah, it's another divide of Sunnis and Shia, and of course within the Sunni community it has substantial Al-Qaeda uh, forces, uh, which uh, we have been fortunate enough to work with the last two Sunni-led Yemeni governments against Al-Qaeda. But now that government, as we've seen in the last two days, has been literally <laughs> under siege uh, I think the president's uh, um, residential palace was actually taken, and uh, I think he's been hiding out in the center of, of town, and I doubt for long. So um, what's going to be interesting is whether the Saudis just stand by and watch this. Um, the Saudis, uh, you know, one of the reasons they're so concerned about Shia-led Iraq is they worry about Shia population in their own east province. And if the Shia, uh, because of Iraq, gain a kind of political expression to their, uh, to their identity as Shia. You know, they're Shia, they're, you know, Shia are like 80% of Bahrain. Uh, they're about, I don't know, 40% in Kuwait. They're, they're, they're big, and, and I, I think they're in the sort of 40 or 30% in, in Yemen, if I'm not mistaken. But clearly, they are on a, on a path that might have them taking power, and are the Saudis going to be indifferent to that? So uh, I think this is going to be a real setback for our al-Qaeda, uh, anti-al-Qaeda efforts, because I think we're going to see this uh, Shia-Sunni divide, which is something we haven't really been able to address in, in Yemen. And we're going to see that fester. and. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to have to have a lot of talks with the Saudis about how that proceeds. I mean, to understand uh, Yemen is to understand a country whose tribes sat in those mountains for centuries, and as people went to the, um, to the holy places, they'd prey upon those uh, pilgrims and rob them. I mean, I don't mean to suggest that Yemeni uh, national identity has to do with thievery of Pilgrims, but there's an element of that. Uh, you know, it's not such a great historical endowment. Uh, as you know, they split up into north and south, which is also tribal and sectarian. They they put together the government for a time, but during these times of great, uh, you know, sort of religious um, uh, fervor in, or frankly, all over the world, but especially in the Middle East, I think they're having trouble holding that together. Mr. Coker, right back here in the back. Can you comment on the diplomatic team that currently advises President Obama? Are these some of your colleagues from the past? Are they career people? Do they share any of your views? If they were standing here today uh, relative to your comments, where would they be? You know, once a, dipl once a diplomat, always a diplomat. <laughs> um, well, no, they, are, uh, they tend to be political appointees. Uh, I would say... For the first time, and I'm trying to think if there was another time, there must have been, but I cannot think of one, the top three positions in the State Department are political. Um, top four positions now uh, are political and not foreign service officers. Um, the White House, the uh, National Security Council staff is uh, probably the biggest it's ever been. It was, it's three times or so larger than it was during the Clinton administration and also during the Bush administration. The usual pattern is presidents come in and they say they want to get the National Security Council smaller than their predecessor and then over the course of the years as a drift upward. In this case, uh, our president, I think, very much wanted to have foreign policy kind of centralized in the White House. So from the Bush period, they went up and uh, it continues to be very big. There are a lot of Foreign Service officers, my colleagues, in that, but the, um, the leadership under Susan Rice, these are not political people. I mean, I know Susan Rice, but she's a, uh, she's a um, uh, political, I mean, um, 
you know, she was a political party person. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, UN uh, ambassador, very political, no sign of any uh, career uh, foreign service officers anywhere near the uh, top echelons of that operation. Uh, I would say it's more political today than it's ever been. Again, I'm hesitating simply because I don't have the data to support that, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, do I think that's the right way to go? No. <laughs> no, I don't. And uh, I really worry about it, frankly speaking. Um, you know, uh, some of these ambassadors who were, you know, on these YouTube uh, um, comedies, you know, this woman going to uh, Hungary, this hotel guy going to uh, Norway or something. I mean, these are people who didn't, who to me, didn't even crack their briefing book, let alone, uh, you know, prepare themselves for those positions. Uh, you know, the military figured this out a long time ago. I remember in the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, Gen General, um, was it Sykes? Sickle? I can't remember. He moves ahead in the left center of the Union lines. He's way out of position. Uh, Stonewall Jackson is basically able to carve him up in the early part of the second day. And uh, so the military figured out early on, we don't want political generals. And, uh, uh, you know, some of these generals in the Northern Army were in the so, so South as well, uh, 150 years ago. But uh, Foreign Service, uh, you know, it's more political by the day, I think. And too often um, you're seeing uh, people who, um, you know, the assumption is that anybody can be an ambassador. Uh, and, and remember, the, the test seemed to be in some of those hearings that were on YouTube, well, the person hasn't visited the country. Well, so what? I mean, that's the least of it. I mean, uh, the real issue is whether that person knows anything about the country. I mean, and so, or understands the, uh, the business. And so I really, uh, I think we have a problem and, uh, but I, don't see any effort, either Republican or Democrat, to fix it in the future. Yes. Thank you. Um, early on in your in your talk, you said something that I really can't comprehend, which uh -oh. is that no, 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 nothing, nothing personal, um, but that uh, when we went into Iraq, uh, we didn't understand the animosity between the. Uh, Shia and, uh, and yeah. the uh, Sunnis. Yeah. Um, there was a terrible, horrible war that went on for 10 years or more between the uh, uh, Iraqi um, uh, Sunnis and the uh, Persian yeah. uh, Shias in Iran. Terrible, uh, a horrible thing. How could we go into Iraq not knowing that these two people didn't like each other? Well, I mean, we certainly understood that um, Saddam and uh, the Ayatollah didn't like each other. We, we certainly understood the Iraq-Iran relationship. Um, if you look, and I spent some time looking at this. I was as shocked as you are about that. So I asked actually to pull up a lot of the um, uh, CIA studies on um, you know, what problems we're likely to uh, uncover in, in Iraq. And there was an incredible amount of discussion about the Ba'athist Party, such that, uh, so the Ba'athist Party was described as a sort of uh, Iraqi version of the Nazi Party that we had to, upon taking over Iraq, we had to engage in a de-Ba'athification process similar to the denazification process in, in post-war Germany. Um, I looked through a lot of this literature because of your question, and uh, I was very surprised that the people writing this never kind of stopped, paused to say, actually, the Ba'athist party in Iraq was mainly a Sunni party and that any anti-Bathism, any, anti, any de-Bathification would likely be perceived, as it turned out to be, as de-Sunnification. Uh, 
And that was, you know, if you look for areas where the Shia and Sunni communities agreed on something, that was one, <laughs> uh, where the Sunnis felt that we had gone in there and cleared all the Sunnis out, and the Shia felt that we had gone in there and cleared all the Sunnis out. So um, I don't think we understood it. Uh, I don't think we understood the centrality of it, and I think it was because Saddam was discussed as such a hideous dictator, which he was, that we kind of took a secular overlay to all this and thought this was about dictatorship and people who wanted to get out from under dictatorship. Plus, many Sunnis um, in Iraq, and to this day, they'll say things like, well, we had nothing to do with Saddam. He was a dictator. Of course, we didn't like him either. Well, I understand why they say that. They don't want to say that Saddam was, you know, their contribution to Iraqi governance. I understand that. But at the same time, uh, Saddam, uh, if you look at who had senior positions in that uh, structure, they're all Sunnis. A few so-called Shia, secular Shia. But secular Shia is a term you ought to be careful about because uh, it's often people who barely know that they're Shia. Uh, so Saddam was a secularist. He was not a deep tribal or deep sectarian. I mean, later on, he would appear in tribal outfits and you know, things like that, but he was a secularist. So I, I guess I can understand why people kind of bought that, uh, you know, believe what he was saying about that. But frankly, if you look at the, uh, how, he, how uh, his government was staffed, they were, they were Sunnis, and I think it was, uh, it was a big mistake on our part. <laughs>